In Millwall Park in East London, there's a long viaduct that isn't connected to anything. This is one of the last visible remains of a curious little railway. Today, we're going to look at the history of the Millwall Extension Railway. The line was a short one, a little over a mile and a half in length, and given the amount of hassle they had getting it built, frankly it's a wonder that they didn't give up before they even started. The line was a branch off the London and Blackwall Railway. The London and Blackwall ran from Fenchurch Street in the City of London to a terminus at Blackwall, a short distance from the Docklands Light Railway's East India Station. So in itself, not a very long line, and always looking for opportunities to expand. They saw potential in the Isle of Dogs, and particularly Millwall. Until the middle of the 19th century, the area was basically a swamp known as Stepney Marshes. There's an indirect relic of this time in the name Mudchute, but that is a whole other story. However, in the middle of the 19th century, the London docks were expanding. Then the Millwall Canal Company started work on a new dock. The London and Blackwall approached the Millwall Canal Company about a joint venture, and they were very willing to make a deal. As a happy coincidence, the general manager of the Millwall Canal Company had a brother who was general manager of the Great Eastern Railway. They were the company that would soon lease the London and Blackwall, which made things a lot smoother. So a route was planned. The branch would leave the London and Blackwall main line at Poplar, then run through the docks to Cubit Town, a fairly new residential district. There, it would meet the ferries to Greenwich, which would ultimately mean a transport link all the way from the City of London to Greenwich, two of the most important places in the country at the time. It was a plan with no drawbacks. Yep. None at all. None whatsoever. Oh wait, yes, parliamentary approval. The companies applied for parliamentary approval in 1863, and they didn't get it. The railway were getting a little antsy because the development of the area was certain to drive land prices up. Meanwhile, the neighbours were complaining, and by the neighbours I mean the East and West India Docks Company. They were rivals of the Millwall Company, and the planned route would cut across their land. They really didn't like the idea of their enemies having that kind of access, and instead suggested a route to the east that would use some already existing track. They made every objection they could think of. Unfair competition, fire risk, noise and smoke, anything. The whole thing had to go into arbitration, and a reluctant agreement was reached. The section of line crossing the East and West India Company's land, which was about 40% of it, would be owned by that company, and steam locomotives would be forbidden over that section. The Millwall Canal Company, too, would own the section of line travelling over their land and the railway would own the rest. Negotiations having reached an unsatisfactory conclusion, a second attempt was made at gaining parliamentary approval in 1865. This time, it was granted. The new line was officially to be called the London, Blackwall and Millwall Extension Railway. So now they had the go-ahead to build their railway that couldn't use locomotives across a swamp owned by two companies that hated each other. Sounds like a recipe for success. At this time in America, the first transcontinental railroad was being constructed. The gangs working on that could, at their fastest, lay over a mile of track a day. I mention this only because, after two and a half years, the Millwall Extension Railway had only managed a little over half a mile. This was nothing to do with physical obstacles. Figuring out how to build track over swamps had been one of George Stevenson's great achievements in the early days of railways. A lot of it was to do with the East and West India, who were still determined to make things as difficult as possible. Imagine hating someone so much that you're willing to lose your own revenue just to make sure that they don't get theirs. Then in 1866, the collapse of the Overend, Gurney and Company Bank prompted a financial panic whose knock-on effect was the closure of many of the industries the new railway was going to serve. The Great Eastern Railway pulled out, and the poor little London and Blackwall had to raise the money themselves. Eventually, they had to apply to Parliament for an extension on the time allowed. And the first section of the line finally opened on the 18th of December, 1871. The line began at a station in Poplar, which was confusingly called Millwall Junction. Very little remains of Millwall Junction, apart from this wall and a bricked-up entrance. It then curved around and passed through what is now the edge of Biddingsgate Market, although I understand this is moving out to Barking soon. 
then, using a timber bridge, it crossed the channel between Blackwall Basin and North Dock. The next station was on the East and West India Dock Company's land and was named South Dock. It was about where what is now George Street in Wood Wharf is. It was a pretty unwelcoming station even back then, being some distance from the nearest road and very basic. Nevertheless, this was where the company's management made their headquarters. Then the line crossed another timber bridge over the South Dock itself and terminated at a station called Millwall Dock, which coincidentally is now the site of the Docklands Light Railway's Cross Harbour. This section was owned by the Millwall Dock Company, which is what the Millwall Canal Company had renamed itself once it became clear that they were all about the docks. While the first trains were running, if you could call them trains, the company was continuing construction through Millwall, with the viaduct you saw at the start. Viaducts are great, because you can build stuff in the arches and rent them out. Railways love viaducts. On the 29th of July 1872, the final section opened to North Greenwich Station. Which, of course, was not in Greenwich, but it sounded better than Cubit Town. That being said, tickets did say North Greenwich Cubit Town on them, so presumably this deceptive naming scheme had backfired on them. I have visions of a bunch of angry sailors threatening some poor ticket clerk when their train terminated on the wrong side of the river, but that's just speculation. North Greenwich was here, and included locomotive facilities and a wall to prevent engines falling in the river. You've heard of light rail, but this was something else. The bridges were timber and the rails were weak. This, and the fact that the line was owned by three different companies, resulted in some very curious and rather inconvenient operations. The first section, as far as Millwall Dock, was operated using a tram car pulled by horses. The argument against steam traction was that the land all around South Dock was covered in timber yards, hence the modern name Wood Wharf. Then a steam locomotive would take over for the rest of the journey. The first engine was a rather strange thing. It was named Ariel's Girdle. This had made a triumphant debut at the Great Exhibition of 1851 and had had a rather adventurous life, including a number of rebuilds, before finding itself acquired third-hand for this branch. It was known to locals as I Can Do It, possibly sarcastically. The only really good thing to be said about it was that at least it was lightweight. This was replaced three years later by an equally antiquated tank engine, seconded from the London and Blackwall main line, and a steam tram engine built by Kitson. After an extremely unauspicious start, things started looking up for the Millwall line. In 1874, the railway acquired the rights to run ferries to Greenwich, and in 1880, the insurance companies authorised the use of steam locomotives throughout, once the bridges had been strengthened. The horses were retired and the old engines were withdrawn and three new locomotives were acquired. These were built by Manning Wardle and were some of the smallest standard gauge passenger engines ever used in Britain. They were nicknamed Coffee Pots, which seems to be the fate of any small, unusual engine. Other engines owned by the Millwall Dock Company were sometimes deputised and the coaches were hired from the Great Eastern Railway. A blow was struck against the line in 1902 when the Greenwich Foot Tunnel was opened. The station and pier at North Greenwich had been subject to a lot of passenger complaints. The pier in particular was poorly lit and treacherous at night. The railway naturally objected, but quietened down a bit when they were paid £8,000 compensation. In 1909, the docks of London were all brought under the ownership of the Port of London Authority. As we've already seen, competition between the dock companies could be damaging, and the risk to the Port of London as a whole was considered such that a single controlling entity was desirable. Because the majority of the line was owned by dock companies, the PLA took over the Millwall line. But all was not well. Passenger numbers were low, even for the short trains of this little line. When Millwall played at home, ticket sales were excellent. But in 1910, when the team moved to Bermondsey, the railway lost one of its few remaining money spinners. In 1922, the coffee pots and Great Eastern coaches were withdrawn and replaced with three rail motors acquired from the Great Western Railway. A rail motor, if you're not familiar, might best be described as a coach with a locomotive built into it. Despite being very light by the Great Western Railway's standards, they were fearsomely large and heavy for the Millwall line. The bridges had to be strengthened, again, and everything that could be done to make the rail motors lighter was. Nevertheless, they were too long for the curves, they often fouled trackside objects, and generally they were a massive pain that no one liked. 
Not that the staff of the railway had to suffer them for too long, as in 1926 the decision was made to close the railway. On the 4th of May that year, passenger trains were withdrawn for good. Goods trains continued for a while longer, but these too were withdrawn in 1929. In 1936, the viaduct was partially demolished, so that was the end of that. Or was it? Well, of course not. You can see at the bottom that there's still lots of video to go. In 1987, the Docklands Light Railway came to town. From Cross Harbour, this reused a lot of the alignment of the old route, even recycling the remains of the old viaduct. Its southern terminus, Island Gardens, was right next to where the old North Greenwich station had been. Until that was the end of the 90s. Lewisham Borough Council had long been campaigning for a link with the DLR. In 1999, their wish was granted with a tunnel under the Thames. This meant that Island Gardens and Mudchute, the two stations at either end of the viaduct, had to be re-sighted, and the line along the viaduct was no longer suitable. So it closed. Again. You can still ride a very small section of the line, sort of. Or at least, the DLR line that replaced it. From Marsh Wall, where the DLR curves south, to the point where this siding comes off the main line, the track follows the old route, almost exactly. There's not much to see of the old railway. But then, there never was much of it to begin with. Good evening! I do hope you enjoyed this video, and there's a like button there to make your opinion known. There's also a dislike button, but you don't need to worry about that. You may wish to subscribe for more content like this, or just because you like subscribing to things. Thanks as ever to my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon, you are the girdle to my Ariel. And I'll see you all again very soon. Cheerio!